still not a goal two years. When I came back to bring a championship to the city, I gave everything that I had. I poured my heart, my blood, my sweat, my tears to this game. Cleveland! This is for you! Oh! You're really good at applauding, Griff. Uh, he, spent, <laughs> he spent three total years with LeBron in Cleveland, and LeBron has come out and said that he was not pulling the personnel strings behind the scenes. A lot of skeptics did not believe him, but you had this interesting quote in January saying, you're basically charged with the legacy of Babe Ruth. Now, for his part, LeBron tweeted this after your departure, quote, if no one appreciated, appreciated you, Griff, I did, and hopefully all the people of Cleveland. Thanks for what you did for the team for three years. We got us one, and then there's a little trophy there. So let me <laughs> ask you, Griff, what was the pressure like being the GM of LeBron James? So it wasn't about being the GM for LeBron, it was really about being the GM for the Cavaliers. I mean, it's a team that had a very clear goal set. Uh, Dan Gilbert likes to say nothing clarifies like clarity. We existed to win championships, and when LeBron is on your team, the perception is you're already in the finals. And if you're any good at what I do, you have to win. Right. And so 29 teams are going to fail right. every year to live up to that. That was difficult. LeBron brought no more pressure to the situation than the actual situation itself did and what our goal set did. What, you know, um, I mean, he wanted no part of bringing more sure. pressure to it. Well, and, and I think the way you described it publicly several times, it was a partnership, right? It's, it would be... Um, just uh, a bad use of your assets not to go to him for his ability to reach out to other players in the league or his opinion on other players in the league, various things of that nature. The, the parts where it became hard, I thought, viewing your job was like, we're in New Orleans last year after a loss, LeBron's frustrated, and rather than talk about the loss, he calls out the state of the franchise and says all these things about what I want to do with the roster, et cetera, et cetera, and the general public takes that to be gospel as if it's just came into the air for the first time out of LeBron right. James' mouth, when really, you and him had spoken about that ad nauseum for months leading up to that point. There was a clear vision behind the scenes, but then people took LeBron's words as if that's the singular vision out of LeBron's mind when really it was a partnership. The other thing is, there's two sides of this, right? There's a side where you're cons consulting with him, you're getting his bouncing mm -hmm. ideas off him. There's another side where you have to be sometimes the boss and you have to come down. What's that like? Well, that, that's a great example of it, actually. That The moment immediately after the New Orleans game, uh, the next home game, was a situation where you, you had to let him know that we had gotten a little outside the lines and that this is what it needs to look like moving forward. Um, LeBron's a basketball savant. Right. And you're not doing your job if you don't talk to him about players. You, you have to do that because he knows more than most of us do. So from that standpoint, he was a great partner. But what happened after that New Orleans game had nothing to do with what he actually talked about at that given time because we'd been talking all season long about the need to have a backup point guard. Right. We lost that New Orleans game because we didn't guard anybody. And so what I talked to him about was, let's just make the main thing the main thing. And mm -hmm. he's very, you know, the one thing about LeBron that's really important, he's incredibly coachable. And, and he wants to do the right thing to win above all else. So. Yeah, and, and I mean, again, LeBron can't be the GM if he literally has someone in David Griffin's position having those conversations with him. Right. Like, that only proves that you need to have someone with the, uh, the clout and the perspective and the self-confidence in that gig to deal with a player like LeBron who has all those things as well. Well, and he absolutely, to be clear, does not want to coach. He doesn't want to be the GM. This is a guy trying to win championships. Right. Being a full-time MVP caliber player is right. a job in and of itself. He doesn't I want to be Doc Rivers. That's, yeah, that's, that's exactly. <laughs> I, I think it's perception more than reality. It, it's a tough job, man. It's, that's why the thing that people don't get is there's so much. It's not just roll the ball out and uh, all right, uh, Bring us, uh, bring us Darren Williams. Right? And there's a lot that goes into all of this, and whether it's the coaching, whether it's the front office work, or as you said, whether it's being an MVP <laughs> candidate. You know, you, you don't have a lot of mental energy to devote to the other stuff. So.